Well, Christina, Homelight called me and said um, they were trying to help clients, uh, specifically buyers in the market today, um, discover um, the difference between a closing cost credit and a price reduction and how that uh, impacts a buyer and a seller. And so we had a great conversation with Homelight. Uh, Homelight is all over the radio, all over TV today, all over the internet. You do a Google ad search for real estate, you see Homelight show up. And the reason they're asking me is because um, if you're a real estate agent, you know this about the market, it is a red hot seller's market. Uh, seller's market is not a feeling we have, it's not just kind of a, a sense. There's actually a definition to a seller's market and hinges on six months worth of inventory. And in the San Francisco Bay Area where we have all of our offices and the Sacramento region, we have a few offices there, uh, it is a red hot seller's market because there is less than a month's inventory. And a seller's market is anytime there's less than one month's inventory. And a buyer's market is anytime there's more than six months of inventory or houses on the market. And a lot of people think, well, that's a great time to sell a home. But I'm going to tell you, that's, Christina, that's a great time to buy a home. Nobody wants to buy a home in a market where there's a surplus of inventory. I mean, it, it does make the process of searching and finding and even writing an offer a little easier. There's less competition, You're not going to get a great price, but that buyer is going to move into the home if eventually become the homeowner. And if that market continues and supply is high and demand doesn't meet the, the, the supply, prices drop. And I think that's the biggest fear of a buyer uh, they don't want prices to drop. And so in this market is a great opportunity for both a seller, because it is a seller's market. They don't have to do nearly as much to put their home on the market that they normally would. Uh, all the agents that are listening to me know exactly what I'm talking about. There's a market where you got to put in updated countertops, new cabinetry, new flooring. Um, you've got to do a lot of work to the property. This is not that market. You can generally reach 100% market value for a property by putting a very little amount into it because of the strong demand and the limited supply of housing. And so for me, this is a kind of a market that is both very beneficial to sellers, but in the long run, this is the kind of market that I would wanna buy a home in, I would want my family to buy a home in, because there's a degree of confidence that if the market continues the way it is and way it has been for nearly 10 years, the longer it continues that direction, the more equity that homeowners establish in their property. Mm -hmm. And um, speaking of the article that you were featured in, it was called Why Price Reductions Be Closing Cost Credits. And I will put this a link to the article on our Agents Thrive web page. But uh, can you give us an example of these two strategies and explain why one is better than the other? Well, let's look at it from both perspectives. Let's look at it from the seller's perspective. And here's what we often hear. Uh, if you're a homeowner that's thinking of selling your home, you think, why don't I just give a carpet credit? Mm -hmm. Why don't I give a landscaping credit? Why don't I give a paint credit? Um, and instead of, instead of uh, you know, making those repairs and selling the property in a retail state versus a wholesale state, and the truth is, is that most buyers, when they think about carpet or paint, they don't think about in the increments of hundreds. And most of the time, I think that they think about it in increments of thousands or even $10,000. Well, mm -hmm. look at that. Look at the interior. I'm going to need to paint it. That's a $10,000 expense. Well, look at the exterior. I'm going to need to landscape it. That's at least twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, right? And the numbers begin to run. And pretty soon, carpet and paint that is generally inexpensive and a great return for in the eyes of a buyer, the perspective, the paradigm of a buyer, that's a $100,000 price adjustment. And so it is much better for a seller to make those repairs than offer a credit. It's much better that they sell the property in a retail state than a wholesale state. Mm -hmm. Selling the property in a retail state in today's market, especially if they do the main five things that we always recommend. And those five things are landscaping, they are painting, they are flooring, uh, they are cleaning and their minimization. Like you do those five things over and over and they have an excellent return of your investment and a return on your investment. And so a seller is generally best uh, suited 
by making the repairs, especially those five that have a high return of your investment, high return on your investment, um, rather than selling it in a wholesale state where the buyer needs to do that. And you might hear somebody say, well, I want them to pick their color carpet. I want them to pick the kind of paint that they, the color paint they want or the type of landscaping that they want to do. Uh, the truth is, is that there are colors and there is landscape, landscaping styles and designs that are very conformative, conforming, and nine out of 10 buyers like those colors. They like that type of landscaping. They like that type of flooring. And of course, you may find one that says, I'd prefer to have this type or that color or this design. But for the most part, the right colors uh, and the right products can be very uh, acceptable to a lot of buyers in the market. And so from a seller's point of view, it is much better to do those repairs that I've mentioned than it is to offer a credit. And the return on that investment is a significant. But if we look at it from a buyer's perspective. What about from a buyer's perspective? Mm -hmm. Well, a buyer's gonna buy a home and they can even, you know, they can ask for a price reduction you know, like if they're negotiating or a credit. And a lot of buyers like the credit option. The reason they like the credit option is because it's cash. It's money available right now. It's money that they can get at the close of escrow. It's 100% goes right to their, uh, to their down payment or even their closing costs. And they're able to apply it. And they really like that. Uh, but what they also should know is that there's a cost to doing so. And this is the part that nobody talks about. One of the costs to doing so is that generally your property taxes are based uh, on what you purchased the home at. Mm -hmm. And so if you purchase the home a little higher so that the seller can give you a credit, you should know that you're going to pay higher property taxes over the life of that, of owning that home. Mm -hmm. And so that can be a cup. That could be a, a, a sizable amount over time, and those two property tax installments that are made are generally a little higher as a result of having a higher price but receiving a one-time credit. The other thing that you should know, and we're in the business of helping people buy and sell real estate, but a credit also generally increases the real estate commission because the sales price is higher. Most real estate op, um, agents and most real estate brokerages operate off of real estate commission, which is based not on the list price, not on the appraised value or even the assessed value, but on the sold price, what a property sells for. And so there's a savings to the seller by doing a price reduction rather than doing a closing cost credit. And so for a buyer, oftentimes it makes more sense if the buyer has the available cash to do a price reduction when they're negotiating rather than asking for a credit. And this market, is my sound off? You're good. I can hear okay. you. Um, in this market with multiple offers and bidding wars, how does this play into that? And then also we've been talking about how sometimes the appraisals um, are lower than the price offered. How does this um, closing cost credits and price reductions, how does that uh, fit into the mix? Well, I think that the first thing you ought to know if you're an agent or if you're writing an offer on a property, uh, there's generally three big things that you ought to be aware of that impact your offer. Uh, the first one, by far, it towers over the rest, is your offer amount. It is your purchase price. What you are, have written in the offer, that makes a significant difference, and it, difference, and it generally towers over uh, other terms and things. And so the ability to come in and write a competitive offer now we have found in a multiple offer environment that offers tend to escalate depending on the price range in $5,000 increments. Let me give you an example. Uh, what we have found is that a half a million dollar price here in the Bay Area in Sacramento County, which is about our median price property, it's about the average price property, that for every offer that comes in, generally they exceed the list price by $5,000. So if you have two offers on the property, the first offer probably comes in at list price and the second offer comes in around $5,000 more. 
and we get up to about 750,000 and that increment begins to change to 10,000. Mm-hmm. And over a million, I'm finding the increment is about 20,000. So for every offer that comes in above a million dollars, we generally see that it increases by about $20,000. And so a five offers, well, you're gonna need to be writing an offer $100,000 over the list price, which can be shocking for most buyers because you would never walk into a, a car dealership or a grocery store or go shop shop at a department store and then bring that product up to the cash register and say, hey, I'm gonna pay more than what the sticker says. But that happens in real estate, especially uh, in the time that we're in with both buyers and sellers as the sellers are transitioning and buying another home they're often uh, paying a little bit more than what the seller has even asked for on the property. And uh, again, I think that's a benefit to the buyer in the long run. And people say, Rick, how is it a benefit when I have to pay more than they're asking for? Well, that buyer is going to move in. They're going to become go from a buyer to a homeowner. They're going to hang their flat screen TV. They're going to move in their couch and their sofa and all of the things that they have. And then they're going to forget about the market. And as real estate professionals, we're going to go back out and sell more real estate and help more people, uh, serve more people in our community. And as they do, we're going to find that they, it, we're, these uh, offers continue and prices continue to rise. And that's a great benefit. Uh, and it's really a, a primary benefit to most buyers. They really want to know that the price that they paid, it, it's going to last. And they're hopeful for anticipated appreciation. So I think that there's a huge benefit um, in writing a competitive offer and knowing in various markets what that increment is. Now, there's both a science and there's an art. Uh, This certainly is an art. It's not a science. It's not every time. And you may have an experience a little bit different. We've had the privilege now, Christina, of serving over a thousand homeowners. And as I've looked at multiple offers, Uh, In so many different environments, I have found that that increment strategy, 5,000 at 500, 500,000, 7,500 at 750,000, and 20,000 now at over a million dollars, those incremental strategies really help us make good decisions for our clients. And I hope if you're a real estate agent, you know, you can adapt that strategy for your clients and begin to help them make good, solid, competitive offers. Then the other thing that is a great benefit to a homeowner that may persuade them to accept the the offer is terms. And Christina, if you wanted to stay in the home after your home was sold, maybe a rent back is very valuable. Uh, Most sellers do not want to move twice. They don't want to move into an apartment. They don't want to move in with family. Uh, They certainly don't want to move in with their (laughs) in-laws. So when we think about that, if you enable somebody to make this transition a little smoother, a little easier, sometimes your offer becomes of great value. And and generally, we can allow a seller to remain in the property as a tenant through a rent back strategy for about a little less than two months. And that can help them transition smoothly. And that is of great value. And the third reason why some a seller may accept your offer is because of really the intrinsic or emotional value. And that's really important. Uh, it, that value may be because the real estate agent is professional. Uh, they know the business, they know the industry, they know how to write an offer. Uh, they know how to navigate successfully through the, uh, the, the choppy appraisal waters and the home inspection waters and all the things that are associated with it. Um, and that may be of intrinsic value to the seller. They want a smooth experience. They don't want to get three weeks into a transaction and have it fall apart. Uh, They don't want to get three weeks into a transaction and and realize that the agent didn't guide their client properly and they didn't do the proper inspections. They didn't do the proper municipal uh, ordinances like gas shutoff valves or smoke detectors or carbon monoxide. They're paying for an appraisal to come to a property multiple times to validate that. And so that intrinsic value, it has a, there is great value in that. And a lot of sellers say, how reputable is this real estate agent? How reputable is this real estate team? What's their credibility? How many homes have they sold in this market? Do they know how to get the job done? 
at the end of the day, an offer is just simply that, Christina. It's just an offer until it closes. And so that's really important. And the third thing that I find that uh, often sellers are really looking for is uh, the intrinsic value of the agent, but also the value of the person that's buying their home. And they like to know that somebody's going to buy their property and take good care of it. Uh, they like to know that the memories that they've had in their home are going to continue. You know, they like to know, I, you know, when I bought our home that we live in now, uh, it was a joke with the seller because he held a 4th of July party. And from my house, I can see some fireworks down below. And some of the neighbors like to light up fireworks and so forth. Probably all illegal, but they light up <laughs> fireworks. And the joke was um, that I would continue, and he wanted it put in the deed, that I would continue the 4th of July party that he held. Now, we laughed about it, and of course, it never went in the deed. But I think that that is a very real sentiment for a lot of homeowners. Well, the positive memories that I've created in this home continue. And uh, this is why you often see uh, a homeowner say, I, I want uh, somebody who's going to live in my property and less of an investor. Now, it doesn't mean that an investor is going to be going to not do those things. Matter of fact, investors generally rent out the property and another family does that. But uh, they generally want to know that the person that they're selling the property to is going to take care of it and continue some of the experiences and memories that they had in that property. And that one's a little harder to quantify, and it certainly doesn't have anything to do with discrimination, but it has just to do with their desire, because they had a great experience in the home in many cases, and they want that to continue. And so um, I find that price is number one, terms are number two, then there's this intrinsic value that's hard to kind of wrap your head around about, is the agent reputable? Uh, does, is the buyer going to continue uh, you know, some of the same experiences that the seller had in their home? Are they going to continue enjoying the home? Um, and they like to know that it went to somebody who is. I'm glad that you brought up price points um, because it seems like if you had to do closing cost credits or price reductions, the price point may have not been right. Or even I've seen like million dollar homes and they bring it down $2,000. And it's like on a million dollar home, come on, what's people. The, I know. And so it, it discredits the agent. Now, how do you find the right price point and how do you know if you're at the right price point? Because do you want to get to the point where you have um, the price reduction and closing cost credits? Well, it's, well, it's a great point, Christina. Um, the, finding the right price is one of the, you know, the, the best things that you can do if you're listing a home. Helping a seller to identify the right price. Because what you realize, it's not what the seller wants for the home. You know, I could want a million dollars for my home. It doesn't mean I'm going to get it. Uh, it isn't how much they owe. I hear that conversation a lot. I owe a lot of money on my home. Therefore, this is what I ought to be selling my home, home for. Well, it doesn't, that doesn't take, that doesn't influence the sales price. Uh, the sales price of the property is, is not how much they have invested into it. You know, I've done all these investments, all these improvements. Uh, those help. Those are, are, are certainly helpful. They help us get a better price, but they don't determine the sales price of the property. There's only one thing that generally determines what the property is going to sell for, and that is what a buyer is willing to pay for. It. What is a buyer willing to pay for? It? And the best way to determine it is to find out what a buyer was recently willing to pay for a home like it in their community. You might have heard the term comparables, comps, CMA summaries. Uh, detailed property value. We call it a fuller value report. This is the idea that uh, this is what a buyer is willing to pay for a home like yours in the community. So I, that's how you want to determine the price of the property. You want to determine it based on what a buyer was most recently willing to pay for one like it. Make sure it's the recent part. A lot of people said, I, I saw my neighbor's home sold five years ago. Very different market five years ago. I, I would even tell you it's a different market five months ago mm -hmm. in comparison to what we have now. You want to find the most recent relevant homes that have sold. You want to find them where they were fully vetted to the market. They didn't sell in, in one day 
or even two days. I think that's a mistake when a property sells in one or two days. I know a lot of agents get excited about it. And even homeowners will say, hey, my home sold in 24 hours or my home sold in 30 minutes. But I wonder how much money they left on the table because it wasn't mm -hmm. properly marketed. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that a, a good property is marketed for a week, at least a week with thorough marketing and videography and virtual tours, aerial photography, uh, uh, populating on various websites all over the internet, exceptional marketing uh, of the property and letting it saturate the market, letting the market fully vet and then providing all of the offers at a particular time tends to ensure that the seller gets the highest possible price. And when we don't have that, and the home sells in less than a day, we often find that that's not a good comparable, not because it wasn't recent and not because it wasn't like the property, it's because it wasn't, the market did not, was not given an opportunity. It wasn't an open market. It was a very limited market. It's much like when somebody sells a home to their friend or family member and they don't put it on the open market. Mm -hmm. When they don't put it on the open market and they sell it to a friend or family member, who knows, maybe somebody was willing to pay more and maybe their friend or family member got a discount simply because they're the friend and family member. And so I think it's really important to note that we also wanna expose it to the full open market so that we can get the highest possible price. I found that uh, in the last 15 years of now serving over a thousand homeowners selling their property, I have found that sellers want generally three things. They want the highest possible price, they want the least amount of inconvenience and they want it done in a reasonable amount of time. Those are the three. And if you can deliver those three, uh, then you'll pr provide a great experience. They'll wanna tell a friend about it. Today, we call those reviews or testimonials and they write about it online, which helps you generate more business. In this hot market, is there a certain type of house that is going faster? Let's say like the under million dollar price point is going faster. Um, what are you seeing? Well, it's all relative based on the community, right? So we mm -hmm. go to different communities, different areas, different price points. You know, we go into Arenda, and if it's under a million dollars, Alamo, Arenda, mm -hmm. Lafayette, mm -hmm. it flies off the shelf. It's the first time home buyer home under a million dollars. But then there are some other communities. We have a market in Sacramento where the average home value is closer to four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and in that market, the median or average home price. Uh, that property is moving rapidly. Generally speaking, in every market, there's a low end, there's a median or average price, and there's a high end in every market you go to, even in small communities. And what you find is that in most markets, when the market is hot like it is now, the lower end is the hottest of okay. all. So in, in the Sacramento area, that might be homes that are priced in the three and low $400,000 price. That's still the entry level that's the low end. And the reason why is the buyer pool is huge. You have FHA, you have VA buyers, you have first time home buyers, and you have investors that all want to compete for that property. And then we have this median price range, and that's typically pretty strong because a lot of buyers want a median price property in their community. And depending on the, na the nature of the community, that median or average price property could be a 500,000, but in some areas in the San Francisco Bay Area, the median price home is well over a million dollars. So it's all relative based on the community, but those can generally be pretty hot, but we start to lose the investors. We're seeing less, buy, less investors, whether they're flip investors or hold investors. Hold investors usually rent it, flip investors usually buy it and flip it. We see less of those at the median price. And the high-end market is generally the softest of all markets, generally speaking, based on the community. And the reason is simple. The reason why the high-end market, generally speaking, doesn't move nearly as quickly is because there are less buyers in that high-end market. In various communities, less buyers can afford those large estates with large lots, and those tend to sit a little longer. They also require a different marketing strategy. Each of these different segments of the market, whether it's the lower price point, the median price point, or the high end price point, 
They all require a little bit different strategy because the audience is different for each and every one of them. And a competitive marketing strategy can help you get the highest possible price for the property. You were talking earlier about um, having, whether you should do the carpets and paint, does that influence whether you're doing a a mid-level house versus a high-end house also? Absolutely. You may find on the lower end properties that these things are not necessary just because the demand is so strong. And remember, we always need two kinds of buyers. We need a, a, a willing buyer. That's a buyer that's willing to write an offer on a property and they want to buy the property. Then I also need an able buyer. And most buyers need financing. And financing often requires an appraisal. And so we need both a willing buyer and we need an able buyer. We need both. To have just one, they're willing but not able, doesn't do you any good. If they're able and they don't want to write an offer on that property, that doesn't do any good. What we found is in the lower end price point, the market is generally so strong that we can find buyers that are willing and willing to take it all the way to the appraised value without the seller putting in a lot of effort into repairing the home. Conversely, the high end market, Christina, you might be required, it might be necessary to make those repairs, those upgrades, moving it into um, to today's standard in order to receive the highest possible price for that property. And so it absolutely differs based on, is it a low end property? Based on the community, based on the market, based on the median price, is it median or average or is it a high end home? And generally speaking, those high-end properties are, are going to require to have those upgrades completed. They're also going to require to have a different kind of quality upgrade. Uh, you, in a lower-end property, you might be fine with a tile or even a formica or a laminate countertops. Mm-hmm. Uh, as we move into properties based on the community that are deemed high-end properties, uh, that, might, that countertop might be uh, a marble, that might be a granite, uh, and you could take that that strategy, um, those insights with flooring. You could take that insight with cabinetry, take that insight with landscaping, around pools, backyards. Uh, all of that tends to change over the, from a low end to median to average to the high end property. And we've talked about how this is a super hot market, low inventory, high demand. Uh, can you talk a little bit to the buyer agents now? What are some of the three? What are some of the things that an agent can do to make their offer stand out? And how do they talk to their clients? Because this market is crazy, and you know prices are high. How do they relate to their clients? There, what we look at, we have a a strategy that um, we have identified in the state that you're describing there are two things an agent needs to do. The first thing they need to do is they need to set great expectations. And number two, they need to keep excitement high. Because if somebody doesn't have the expectation, you know, Christina, we referenced the uh, metaphor of going in and buying a car or going to a grocery store, department store, you're not used to paying for the item at the cash register and we do it every day in real estate. So a great real estate professional professional is setting those expectations and they're never telling and selling that's I, it frustrates me to no end when an agent just tells and sells all day what we ad- advocate is show and share sell a show and share is so much more effective especially today with social media you know you can share it on social media and begin to create conversations about it you know we share our properties and we'll ask what do you love about this kitchen what do you love about this backyard and we're sharing, showing and sharing the inventory and people want to engage in it. Nobody wants to be told and nobody wants to be sold, right? Mm-hmm. There's an old saying that says, everybody wants to buy, nobody wants to be sold. And so when you show and share, you're helping people make a good buying decision. You're not selling them. The second thing that they ought to be aware of um, is that we got to keep excitement alive. Imagine, Christina, that you and your husband and your family, we go out and look at a home, we write an offer, and it's not accepted. And we do that again, and it's not accepted. It can be uh, very easy for you to get discouraged. It can be really easy for you to get frustrated. It might even be easy for you to say, you know, I don't think this might be the right time. Or, you know, this may not be right for us as a family. Uh, But then the challenge is, is in the state of that market, prices go up. So you disconnect for a year. and You say, okay, Rick, we, we, we were engaged last year. It was a little frustrating. 
we lost our excitement about buying a home because our offers weren't accepted. Let's begin again this year and home values are up 10% and in a $500,000 home, that's up $50,000. And now instead of looking at those four bedroom homes, Christina, you're now looking at the condos and townhomes because hmm. that's the price difference. And if you're looking at condos and townhomes, you may be outside of the market a year later as prices rise, uh, you know, the year after. And so a big part of it is a great real estate professional. They're setting great expectations. Christina, this is what you can expect in the market. Mm -hmm. And they're doing it before it happens. Doesn't do you any good when it happens and then to say, oh yeah, let me tell you how you should expect. No, no, the expectations occur before it happens and then you keep excitement alive. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna get the next one. Okay, don't worry about it. We got to write, you know, and you and a good a great real estate agent, our, our team has buyer specialists. And what we teach them to do is we teach them to figure out about how many offers do you write before one gets accepted. And so I might say, Christina, on average, I show 10 offers and then or 10 homes, and then we write an offer. That doesn't mean you have to do that. It doesn't mean you're obligated to only see 10 homes. It doesn't mean you couldn't write on the first one or the 25th home. But on average, we show 10 homes, and then we write an offer. And then we say, and on average, Christina, we write three offers and then one gets accepted. And maybe in some markets, it's five. Maybe in some markets, it's two. And at least if you know that, you can say, I know you're still disappointed because that offer didn't get accepted. You got beat out because the price was higher, the terms were better, or they just wanted to work with that agent, or they wanted to sell to that particular buyer. But hang in there, because on average, we show 10 homes and we write an offer. On average, um, we write three offers and one gets accepted or whatever your numbers are. Don't make these up, right? That's the worst thing you could do is make these numbers up. What you want to do is actually start tallying. I show so many homes and then I get an offer. I make an offer and I make so many offers and then one gets accepted. And then Christina, you can begin to say, this is normal. This is okay. This isn't weird. This isn't strange. This is acceptable. I don't like it, but I'm willing to, to continue. And then once you get your offer accepted, if we reverse that scenario and you called me in a year later and said, my offer was accepted, we moved into the home, we're happy, and the home value is up 10%, the home, the average home value is 500,000, you made $50,000 worth of equity. You do that for a couple of years and now you're ready to move up to the next property. So I think that a great real estate agent, uh, they know the three things I talked about before. They know the terms, they know how to get, write a great offer as far as price and how to increase the offer based on you know, different intervals. Uh, they know how to position their client to be very attractive to the homeowner and position themselves professionally. But they also know how to keep excitement high and expectations clear. When they do that, they're in a place where people just have a better experience. It's not about selling them a home. When you really think about it, you and I never forget a move. I remember the last time I moved. I remember when Jennifer and I moved from the house that we had in Antioch to another house we had in Antioch. And I remember the move. I remember moving from Hayward to Oakley. I remember moving from Oakley to Oak. I remember these moves and what happened. Nobody ever forgets the move. And your job as a real estate professional is to help them have the kind of experience not just the outcome, the experience that they're excited to tell a friend about. That doesn't happen without good expectations, and that doesn't happen without keeping excitement alive. If the excitement dies, the motivation dies, and it dies all too often today. You remember as a kid, Christina, we used to play video games, and we'd have so much stamina. You remember that a little yeah, stamina yeah. or how, you'd have so many lives, if you will, and then you'd fall into a pit and one of the lives would be disappear, right? It'd be gone and you now have two lives instead of three or you'd have one or you're out and it's the end of the game. Well, I think every buyer has a stamina. Mm -hmm. I think every buyer has a certain amount of lives, if you will. And if you don't set good expectations, you'll clock through those lives by writing offers. You'll clock through that stamina and they're out of stamina. They're out of energy, they're out of engagement. They don't return your call, they don't return your email. It's the end of the game. In comparison, you keep excitement alive. And you set really good expectations and we can help them cross the finish line, have the kind of experience that they're excited to tell a friend about. And at the end of the day, they own real estate. 
And in my experience, um, not owning real estate can be hazardous to your wealth. So own real estate and you're helping people do that. And you're helping them do it in such a way where the experience of home ownership matters, not just the outcome. It's the process that nobody ever forgets. It's the moving truck. It's ordering pizza and eating them on moving boxes. Uh, it's the time that you unlock the door and you move, you know, and you walked in past the threshold of your first home or your second home or your first day in the property. It, it, it's, that's what people remember. And when they think about real estate and think about having a positive experience, I want them to think of you. I want them to think of me. I want them to think about the experience that they had. That's so, so smart. Um, and final question. I've heard our agents comment about how appraisals, we've been talking about appraisals, aren't always matching the increased price of multiple offers and how mortgage rates are crazy and competitive right now. So you were saying multiple lives. How do we effectively use the lives that we have and avoid these problems with um, appraisals? How do we create good relationships with these other professionals that we rely on to get the best outcome for our clients? Well, I think that's, that's really important because an appraisal can absolutely ruin your transaction. Mm -hmm. You know, if you discover that an appliance isn't working, you need a new dishwasher and it's five or $700, generally you can find a way to fix that in a real estate transaction. Maybe it's a credit, maybe it's a price reduction, maybe even the agent's helping you fix it. Uh, with the stove, you could do that too, right? You could do that with a washer, dryer, refrigerator, on and on and on. You can't do that with a $100,000 appraisal problem. Yeah. You can't do that when the property doesn't appraise and there's a significant gap and the buyer can't make it up and the seller in their mind, they've already spent the money, haven't they? They get an offer and they've already mentally thought, I'm buying the car and I'm buying the boat house and I'm buying yep. this, I'm buying that, and new pair of shoes and everything else that goes with it, right? And and so if you take somebody down that road and then you ask them to reduce the price, you ask them to give up the car they have in their mind that they're buying, and you ask them to give up the house they're buying, they're not going to do it. Especially when they had 10 offers, 12 offers, mm -hmm. 15 offers, they just said, well, I'm going to go find another one. But at the end of the day, the buyer lost the house. So how do you do it? One, you write a competitive yeah. offer. And you look at the comparables when you write the offer and say, this is in alignment with the market. Number two is you make sure that the appraiser knows the area and knows the market. And you can provide them comparables. They don't have to take them. They're not obligated to take them. But you can provide them what you thought when you wrote the offer on the property. And that can be really helpful because I, I hear appraisers regularly. They'll say things like, uh, I've never even been to your city before. I've never been in this county. This is my first time here. Tell me more about the neighborhood. Tell me more about the, they're supposed to be the market expert and they don't know how to pronounce the city you're living in. <laughs> That's a problem. So you can provide them. This is what I was thinking, Christina, as an appraiser. This is what I was thinking when I wrote, wrote the offer on the property. This is what I was thinking when I listed the home. And I just wanted to provide those to you and you can use them as you see fit. The second thing that you can do uh, that can really help eliminate appraisal problems, and this one's huge, and I see very few people doing this. So if you do this, you're gonna eliminate a lot of your appraisal issues. Have the homeowner itemize the improvements they have. Have the homeowner put a list of improvements when, and do it in three columns, what the improvement was, when they did it, and how much it cost. And, and then give that to the appraiser. Appraiser walks through literally 15 minutes, maybe 20, walks through the property, does some measurements, but they didn't notice that that was a marble countertop with a farm, you know, a farm sink uh, with these upgraded wolf appliances with under cabinet lighting, you know, with beautiful cherry wood cabinets. Like they didn't notice that, they just think it's a nice kitchen. So when you begin to itemize that, what an, a good appraiser will do is they can use that list, not all of it, not the entire amount, but they'll use that list to give a premium, to give a premium. And maybe that premium is enough to bridge the gap from what the neighbor's home sold for without any upgrades um, and helps bridge the gap to what the buyer's willing to pay for it. And often it does. And the third thing I like to do 
and especially with appraisers that uh, they are coming from out of area is I like to make sure they know or have a copy of where the market's at. You know, the nature of an appraisal in today's market is kind of archaic because when a market is rising, property values are rising as fast as they are, you go back and you find a comparable. Usually they go back six months. Wow. Home values have changed drastically in six months. Tens of thousands of dollars. And the appraiser goes back and says, I found this home that sold six months ago and this home that sold six months ago. And with our high prices here in the Bay Area and Sacramento region, it's very common for the appraiser to say, those homes sold for significantly less six months ago. So I like to share with them the trajectory of the market. So I like to share with them how much the market is appreciating every month. Mm -hmm. And I'll usually go back six months and I'll say from, if we're in December, I might say from June or January, I might say from July, the market has appreciated. And that way when they pull that comparable that's six months old and $50,000 below what our current sale is, there's justification of why that makes sense. And the appraiser can tell the story. I've seen appraisers in this market actually identify on an appraisal that the market is depreciating, that it's going down, that there's, really? there's too many homes for sale and there's not enough buyers. Well, the truth is they just don't know that market. That could be the case in LA. That could be the, the case in the Central Valley. That could be the case uh, certainly in San Francisco, but it may not be the case in Sacramento. It may not be the case in Elk Grove or Richmond or Concord or, Elk, or in Antioch where a lot of our offices are. And so we wanna make sure we don't push it on them. We don't require they, don't, they use it. Uh, we just try to be a helpful resource to say, look, we study the market. That's what we do as a profession. Here is the best comparables that I used when making an offer on the home. I thought they might be of value to you. Uh, here's a copy of what the seller said they've invested in the home mm -hmm. and give an itemized list with those three categories, the improvement, how much they spent, and when they put it in. And then we will give them the market stats showing that the market's not falling, it's not declining, but it's appreciating. You do those things with an appraiser, uh, you will minimize many, many of your appraisal problems. And remember, appraisal problems, they can be transaction killers. They can absolutely destroy a real estate transaction and make it non-repairable. Buyer can't make up the gap. Seller's not going to drop the price. Maybe they can't drop the price. All of that's very problematic uh, for a buyer who's wanting to deliver the kind of experience their client, their buyer, eventually the homeowner, wants to talk and tell a friend about. Well, that's all the time we have for today. And you gave us a ton of information. <laughs> I mean, it, you're, you're a walking toolbox because I filed this all the way and everything is so practical and it just makes sense. So thank you for sharing all of this, Rick. Um, join us next week when we talk about what is a passive house and are they worth it for buyers, which is another article that you were featured in. And so I'm excited. I don't know anything about this and I know that you will have a ton of information to help me. So thank you everyone for spending part of your day with us. Be sure to put in a great review for our podcast on whichever platform you're on. And we hope you have a great day. Thanks, Rick. Thank you.